Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 75. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 10, and we'll get into our study as we are continuing our study through the Psalms. Psalm 75 marks our halfway journey. It's taken us three years to get here, so that gives you an idea how long it's going to take to conclude. Actually, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your wondrous works. Declare that your name is near. When I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. Selah. I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn, do not lift up your horn on high, do not speak with a stiff neck. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Now, as we begin Psalm 75, a, little, a couple of little background thoughts. It doesn't take more than a few seconds to put them out for you. This is a psalm, as we see, uh, identified. It's a psalm written by uh, a man by the name of Asaph. And Asaph was a Levite, a Jewish priest, and he was also a musician. His name is found in the book of Ezra in chapter 2, verse 41. He wrote a number of the psalms, and uh, this means that he wrote somewhere six centuries or so before Christ. As we look at this particular psalm, the commentators that I use pointed out that this is a psalm of thanksgiving, thanksgiving to the Lord. And that's how we begin in verse 1 with a word of thanksgiving. He says, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your wondrous works declare that your name is near. So he begins to thank God for his wondrous deeds, his wondrous works. The word wondrous means extraordinary. And the deeds that he's speaking about basically uh, consist of a couple of things that we could immediately identify. One is his works in, in nature, which would include his miracles. He thanks God for the miracles that God does, and also his work of salvation. So he's saying to the Lord, I give you praise, I give you thanks, I thank you for your extraordinary deeds, especially as I look out and I see what you have done in your creation, as well as the fact that you are a miraculous God. And besides that, I thank you, God, I give you praise and all because you are a God who has saved us. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, verses 33 and 34 in the Old Testament, uh, the Bible says, Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? He says, God, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for your redemption. I thank you for your creation. I thank you for all that you've done. And of course, something that we as Christians ought to learn to do is praise and thank the Lord for all the good that he has done on our behalf. And that's how he begins this psalm with word of thanksgiving. Now, in verse 2, the Lord is speaking, and he says, when I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. So one thing that stands out, and I want you to see this, is that he points out, when I choose, when I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. So one thing that stands out is the patience of God. And God is extremely patient with all of us. He doesn't judge us the, the, the minute that we fail, because if that were the case, I wouldn't be here tonight teaching you, and you wouldn't be here tonight listening to me. If he judged us immediately, the first time we blew it, it would be all over. But God is very patient with us. And, and sometimes I think about how patient the Lord has been in, in my life. I'm certain that some of you, as you're growing older, realize that God has been extremely patient with you too. I can think of various times as I was growing up when I, when I was almost killed in, in an accident here or an accident there. But God was very kind to me and, and allowed me to continue living until I was 20 years old and committed my heart to Jesus Christ. God is very patient. He deals with us in a patient way. He doesn't judge us immediately. He gives us time. He gives us time to repent from, my, from our sins. In 1 Peter, in, in the New Testament, in chapter 3, verse 20, the apostle Peter said it this way. He said, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. 
In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. God waited patiently. We know the story of how that God had spoken to Noah and said you're to build an ark, but the patience of God lasted some 120 years as he built that ark and as he preached as a preacher of righteousness and all, and then judgment came. And so God is very kind to us. He doesn't nail us the minute that we blow it. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, the question is asked, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? God is kind. He, he takes his time with us and doesn't, doesn't discipline us in terms of punishing us or judging us immediately. And that's why he says, when I choose the proper time, I will judge uprightly. There is a proper time. In Ecclesiastes 3.17, uh, we read, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Acts 17.31 says, He's appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He's given assurance of this by raising Jesus from the dead. And so there's a perfect time when all of this judgment will take place, and that's what God is speaking about here in verse 2 when he says, when I choose the proper time, I will judge. And I want you to notice also, I will judge uprightly. I will judge fairly. I will judge righteously. I will have all of the information, and I will be able to make the proper judgment. Now, in verse 3, it's, an in it's interesting how he says, the earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. I set up its pillars firmly. The word silah there means think about that. But interestingly, he says, the earth and all its inhabitants are dissolved. That's another way of saying, and this I thought interesting as I was studying this and looking this up, saying, well, what does that mean? You know, the earth is dissolved. Is it like a, a snail that you drop salt on and watch it dissolve? I don't think so. So what does it mean? Well, it means that um, sin has an eroding effect on us and society in general. Sin is corrupting. It erodes. You don't get better with time normally. You get worse. You start to lie when you're a small child or steal when you're a small child or whatever sinful little thing that you try to do to the best of your ability when you're a small child. You start out not doing it very well, but if you continue lying long enough, you can get pretty good at it. You can, you can lie so long and, and so well that people everywhere will believe you. You know, you can begin to become pretty good at sin. And sin does have a corroding effect. Not just individually, but sin has a corroding effect in, in the nation. When the nation begins to think of sin as being okay and acceptable, it actually destroys that nation. And so the Lord is pointing that out when he speaks about the inhabitants being dissolved. Now, one of the things that he also says, and I want you to see this, when he says, I set up its pillars firmly. Now, if the earth and its inhabitants are being dissolved, what are you speaking about, Lord, when you said, I, I set up its pillars firmly? Well, what does a pillar do? A pillar holds something up. And so in order for it to not be completely corrupted or destroyed, I put something in place to hold it up so that it doesn't completely fail. What would that thing be? Well, in the New Testament, uh, I think it's identified for us. It's found in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. In Matthew chapter 5, in the New Testament, verse 13, Jesus Christ is speaking to believers. And he says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it, speaking of the earth, be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The church is what God has placed in the world to keep it from being completely destroyed. Our responsibility is to add flavor to the world and to keep it from being completely decayed. And so the way, one of the ways the Lord keeps the world from going completely bad is through the church. That's what you and that's what I have as an impact and an effect. Now, in verse 4, continuing, he says... I said to the boastful, do not deal boastfully. To the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high. Do not speak with a stiff neck. When he speaks about lifting up the horn, it's another way of speaking of pride. And he's saying don't be proud and don't be boastful. 
Uh, those who are being spoken about are the proud and arrogant people who love immorality. These are the people who ignore God's commands, and these are the ones who present themselves as great and very important. And so he says, don't be raising yourself up and exalting yourself. Why? Well, verse 6, exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is fully mixed. He pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. Now, first... I'll just give you what he's saying here, and then I'm going to move into an application. First, when he says in verse 6, exaltation comes neither from the east nor the west nor from the south, he's simply saying God's judgment is universal. God rules the world. The world ultimately is judged by him. No matter where that person is who exalts himself against God, God still is the judge. He's, he's the judge of a person here in, in Chino, California, as well as the judge of somebody in China, as well as the judge of somebody in France. He's the judge of the whole earth, and that's the point that he's making. No matter where that person is, God is still their judge. Um, in Proverbs, in chapter 15, verse 3, the Bible says, "...the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good." And God is going to bring judgment, and He makes it clear in verse 8 that that judgment is very thorough and very, very severe. And so the point he's making is a very simple one. I am the one who is to be exalted, and I am the one who determines what I'm going to do in somebody's life. Now, in verse 6, I'm going to give you a basic application, something that the Lord has given to me in a personal level for some time, and let me share it with you, and hopefully it'll make some sense. I want you to see this again. Verse 6, exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one, he exalts another. And so we've recently been in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, you have James and John. James and John, with their mother Salome, approach the Lord Jesus Christ. Salome falls at the feet of Jesus, and as a mouthpiece for her sons, as they speak along with her, is asking for a favor. James, James and John say, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus asks them, what is it that you want? We want you to grant us permission to sit uh, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. We are asking you for positions of power and authority. We want to have a place of prominence. Well, this scripture here tells me exaltation comes neither from the east nor the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. What they were asking for was the wrong thing. That's why Jesus says to them, you know not what you ask for. Are you able to drink of the cup? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And that's when they went on to say, we are able. So the bottom line is, and this is a very important spiritual point that I hope I'm able to clarify. The bottom line is, is that God is the one who places you exactly where he wants you to be. God is the one who opens up one door while closing another. God is the one who gives you opportunities that no man can really give to you. God is the one who does that because God calls you to a certain place. And if you follow him, he's going to lead you to the place he wants you to be. So we cannot seek honor for ourselves and expect to receive it because it's God who determines what we are to have. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 45, verse 5, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Are you trying to do something to get your face in front of people? Don't take that route. Psalm 113, 7 and 8, he raises the, the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with princes of his people. God has a way of opening doors. God has a way of getting you in the place he wants you to be and this is so practical, and yet so many people fail to understand that. So many of us have a tendency of attempting to, to force ourselves into a place where we can have prominence. That's a human nature. But even as I was sharing with you just recently, God has a way of doing what God wants to do. And it amazes me that He'll put you in a place that you didn't ask for. All you need to do is just simply say to the Lord, Lord, I just want to be used by you in whatever capacity you want to use me. You know, this fellowship has been going 23 years. Before we had this church here, I was an assistant pastor in another Calvary chapel for two years. 
Prior to that, I was teaching home Bible studies for six years or so, five years. And um, as I've shared with you on many occasions, you know, the only thing that I wanted to do was to teach the Word, just to have a group of people that I could sit down with and share the Word of God with. It's always been that simple. It's never been anything beyond that. Our first Bible study started with a handful of people, and that was the way it was for a, a number of years, for eight or nine years, you know, never more than 25, 30 people. When this church began, we had 25 people. We had 25 adults and about 15 children. And that's how this fellowship began. We didn't come in with a, a demographic study. We didn't look around and say, hmm, let's move into Ontario Chino because there is this kind of need and this kind of, you know, ethnicity and, 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 and all of that. What we did is we said, Lord, what would you have us to do? From my perspective, um, I'm, you know, L.A. County guy, grew up in Norwalk and all born in Whittier, raised in Norwalk. And for me, you know, I, I just as soon stay there where I'm at. I mean, have all my friends and, and family here in this area. Let's do Bible studies here and plant a church. There was a Calvary Chapel already in Downey. And all, and, and I thought, well, you know, whatever the Lord wants me to do. And so Marie and I actually went to Calvary Downey for a little while. My daughter, Corinne, was, was dedicated to the Lord uh, at Calvary Downey, you know, 27 years ago. And, and I was fine with that. And they had an opportunity for us to go into a, a little Bible school, the very first uh, um, pastor's or shepherd's class that Jeff ever had there at uh, Calvary Downey. And I thought, well, maybe that's the thing for me. So I went to that class. And, and I thought, maybe the Lord's going to use us, but God didn't want to use us there in that area. He opened up the door for us to come out to Claremont. And when we went out to Claremont, I got involved in a church there, Calvary Claremont and all, and began to serve the Lord there. And eventually, the doors opened up for us to begin a, a study in, in the city of Ontario. We started that study, and the rest is history. That's how we got here into the city of Chino, just step by step. But it never was one of these things like saying, um, I want to have a church that's a big church. I want to build a big building. I want to have a lot of land. I'd like to have thousands of members. I want to be on the radio. I want to write some books. I want to travel. It was never anything like that. It's just that the Lord has a way of placing you where He wants you in the time that He wants you there. So Sunday, this last Sunday, I go into my office after third service, and before I go home, I read my emails. And as I'm reading the emails... I read that I, I just received an invitation uh, by the White House. Can you imagine that? The White House to go to New York City so that I can be part of, be, I've been invited to be going to the Republican National Convention to get involved in a couple of other things, a family life kind of thing. They've invited us to that. And I'm sitting there in my office saying, what's this all about? Do they need somebody to wash the dishes or mow a lawn? Why are they asking me to go out there? You know, what is this all about? You know, and I tell my mom, yesterday, mama calls me, you know, and, and is talking to me, or actually Monday is, is talking to me, and I said, do you want to know something, mom? I'm, I'm going to New York. I mean, I was invited to go and to be part of this, and she starts to cry. And I think, why are you crying? You know, what's this all about? And it's because my mom is thinking, you know, I know what a jerk you are. <laughs> yeah. I raised you. You know, I, I, what an amazing thing that the Lord does that. You know, but we're not knocking on doors and banging on doors and saying, I want to do this, I want to get this honor, I want to have these kinds of things. The president's going to speak to us. You know, and I'm thinking, what's that all about? Exaltation, when God, promotion, it comes from the Lord. It doesn't come through your strategies. It doesn't come from, from you trying to work something out to somehow get to be known by somebody to make sure that that happens. It comes from just loving the Lord, serving Him faithfully where you're at. He opens a door, and you're willing to step in. That's how it works. And we need to understand that. I think there are so many people who don't understand that. Now, if I were speaking to pastors, I've said this to pastors before, and I've asked the question to pastors, but I could ask the same to those who are here who teach Bible studies. Uh, and I've asked the pastors before, I've said, you want to have large groups, don't you? You want to have large churches, don't you? You know, most pastors want a large church. And so I'll ask that. You want a large church, don't you? And, and, and if they're honest, they begin to nod their head, and they'll say, yeah, I'd like that. And the next question I ask is, why? Why do you want that? Because the question is that you have to ask for yourself is, why is that something I want? Because motive is everything in, in the kingdom of God. Why do I want this? Do I want this so that God is glorified, or do I want this so that people know who I am? And so exaltation, promotion doesn't come from man. 
It comes from the Lord. And when it comes from the Lord, he's the one who's lifted you up, and he's the one who sustains you. When it comes through you, when it comes to your efforts, when you're pushing yourself into the front, then ultimately it's going to be taken from you because it's not from him, it's been from you. And so he points that out in verse 6. Exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. God is the judge. He puts down one, exalts another. The hand of the Lord, there is a cup. The wine is red. It's fully mixed. In verse 9, I will declare forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will also cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And so I sing. I sing of God's work. I sing of the things that he has done. I'm amazed at his creation. I am blessed by his salvation. And those things serve as a reminder that I might sing and bless the Lord by rehearsing these things, by, by taking the time to smell the roses that were created by God. It gives to me an opportunity to worship him. And as I do this on a daily basis, basis worship will remain fresh in my life. One of the things that I want to encourage you with, and then we'll move into Psalm 76, is to remember verse 1 when he says, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks. When you have a heart of gratitude, worship remains fresh. When you start expecting God to do things for you and then get disappointed when he doesn't, then you're going to wilt right on the vine. But when you awaken yourself daily and refresh yourself in the goodness of the Lord and His mercies that are new every morning, you will have a fresh relationship with the Lord and you will be able to worship Him in a wonderful way. Psalm 76, beginning at verse 1. This is another psalm of Asaph. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is His tabernacle and His dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and sword of battle, Selah. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The, so the stout-hearted were plundered. They have sunken into their sleep. None of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. You yourself are to be feared. And who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose in judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath you shall gird yourself. Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth." This, again, is a psalm, a psalm of Asaph. It's a song that celebrates God as a divine warrior, one who dwells in Zion. Now, in verses 1 through 3, notice how he begins by saying, In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel, in Salem also in his tabernacle. And Salem also is his tabernacle. So the point he's making is a very simple one. God has chosen to dwell amongst his people in Jerusalem. He is there present with them. Now, if you take notes, 1 Kings chapter 6 Verses 12 and 13, God is speaking in that particular portion of Scripture, and this is what he says. Concerning this temple which you are building, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my word with you which I spoke to your father David. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. And so he is here amongst us. He has promised to be so if we remain faithful to him is what the psalmist is saying. If we keep his word, he is dwelling amongst us. Now, the knowledge that God is there and that he dwells among them gives them peace and gives them joy. Notice in verse 3 how he says he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and sword of battle. God is making a name for himself because God is a warrior. He gives great victory. And he is the one who reigns. He is the supreme one, and he's giving God praise for that. Verse 4, when he says, you are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey, the stout-hearted were plundered. They have sunk into their sleep. None of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. God is revealed here. Now notice when it says in verse 4 that he's glorious and excellent. God is revealed as enveloped in brilliant light as he defeats his enemies. Now, it's interesting, as I was looking at this, notice with me that he speaks concerning the mountains of prey. Now, that's an interesting phrase. It's something that's kind of 
kind of enigmatic. It's mysterious. It can mean various things. One, it can speak about an enemy's stronghold. But secondly, it could be speaking of Jerusalem. When it refers to it as being a mountain of prey, we need to remember that this is a city that had been besieged some 27 times, which would make it a mountain of prey. Fierce armies had come against it, but he's pointing out that, that they can't defeat God in battle. So, verse 7, you yourself are to be feared. The presence, in the presence of the judge of the universe, all creation is going to stand silent. He brings judgment to reveal that he's the king and he saves those who are afflicted. Every once in a while, somebody will say something like, when I see God, I'm going to tell him. And I think, oh, <laughs> sure you are. You know, puny little fist in the face of God, you're going to tell him something. I don't think so. All of us at that time, those of us who are born again, are going to be made to stand because he makes you able to stand. So we're going to be able to be standing in Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ before God. When we see God, we aren't going to have any questions. Sometimes people say, oh, I've got a ton of questions to ask the Lord. Well, the Bible says, then we shall know even as we are known. So when I enter into the kingdom of God and I'm standing before the presence of God, my questions are now fulfilled. I have no questions. They're all being answered because he is the answer to all questions. He is the truth, you see. Now, an unbeliever who stands before the presence of God actually isn't standing before him. He's going to be prostrate before him. Why is that? Because God is the God of righteous judgment. And in standing for the Lord without the righteousness of Christ, the only thing left to you is going to be judgment. See, the only way that we can have a relationship with God that is portrayed to us in Scripture is through faith in God. In the Old Testament, you have all of these, these offerings, these sacrifices that prefigure the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you have offerings of bulls and, and lambs and rams and, and, and various other grain offerings and all, and they serve as a reminder for every time the individual comes and makes that offering, they are remembering that they have a sin issue with God. And so every year they have all these offerings, and, and there are daily offerings as well as, as various seasonal offerings and all, and then you have the main offering on the Day of Atonement, and in those offerings is a constant reminder of a question that relates to sin that has yet to be fully answered. When Jesus Christ came, the New Testament reveals that he took upon himself all of God's righteous anger. And God poured his wrath out on Jesus Christ, who as the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. We now, because of what Jesus has done, we now are able to look to him as our propitiation. The word propitiation speaks of him satisfying God's righteous anger over sin. Because God is righteous and holy, he has a righteous anger towards sin. Because God is loving and just, he makes provision for it. And so because none of those sacrifices ever offered were able to perfectly satisfy him, he satisfies himself. He does so by sending Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now what we do is we look to Jesus Christ in faith and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know and believe that Jesus took upon himself my sin when he died on that cross. When Jesus is on the cross and he's been whipped and beaten and tortured and now is finally dying, one of the last things he says is, it is finished. When he says it is finished in the literal Greek, Raw likes to say the little Greek. No, in the literal Greek, in the literal Greek, what he is saying is paid in full. When Jesus dies on the cross and says it is finished, he is literally saying it is paid in full. The debt has been erased. It's as if when you get, uh, you've paid off one of your cards or one of your bills and they give to you the receipt there and that says paid in full. That's what happened with your sin when Jesus died on the cross. It has been paid in full. Yet I, by faith, need to receive that. The debt has been paid in full on my behalf, but I receive that as a gift by faith. So as I trust in the Lord for my forgiveness and I say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, the Bible says that he is righteous and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. 
That comes through the blood of Jesus Christ that washes me clean from all of my sin. Now I become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now I become the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God now dwells within me. Now I know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And now I can call God my Father because the Spirit now bears witness with my spirit that I am a son of God. And because I have received Jesus Christ, to as many as received him, to, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name, because I have received and believed in Jesus Christ, I now have everlasting life. I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And I have a brand new life. And now the life that I live, I, I live and walk in faith because Jesus died for me. And that's how it works. So when I stand before the Lord, I'm able to stand before him in the righteousness of God because he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so as I have this position of righteousness in Jesus Christ, as I'm now made righteous by him, then I'm able now to stand before him. But a person who comes before the Lord in his own or her own goodness well, the Bible says that their goodness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. There is none who are good. There are none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. And that's because our sin nature taints all of the things that we do. Even the best things that I want to do are going to be tainted by self-interest. It requires the Lord to work in my life so that I die to myself and honor him so that I can stand before him. And in doing so, I can say God is my God and I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's what he's speaking about as we're speaking about concerning those things there. He is excellent and the Lord gives to us blessings. And we can, we can stand in his presence as he says in verse 7. You yourself are to be feared. You you, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose in judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth, Selah. Verse 10, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. Man's rebellious anger and warfare against God only results in greater praise to God ultimately. Why? Well, he's going to subdue those who, who hate him. And it's going to reveal how great and powerful he is. And as believers rejoice in his victory, it results in greater praise to him. Verse 11, make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. One last thought, and I want you to see this in verse 11. Let, let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. What is the problem with a lot of people today? What does the Bible say the problem with people is? There is no fear of God in them. That's the problem. There is no fear of God in them. There are, there's a whole generation that has no sense of fear of God at all. They think that they're going to get away with all of their sin. But if you love the Lord, you're going to have a, a devout, reverential sense of awe at this God that you worship. When I was a brand new Christian, I don't know, somebody here is, might say, after I tell this story, you're, you might say, oh, you're superstitious. I don't think so, but I'll tell you the story anyway. If you think I'm superstitious, shame on you. <laughs> All I know is this. When I was a fir first a believer, and I was only a couple years old in the Lord, I had a tendency of blaming God for everything that went bad in my life. I just had that habit. And I can still remember, I had just gotten out of the Army. Actually, I had been out of the Army for a few months. And uh, you need to remember, just for some context, that this was back in 1972-73. And, and long hair was still the thing. I had just gotten out of the Army. I had been cutting my hair now for almost two years. And I wanted to wear my hair long. And I used to wear my hair long and all. And so I started growing my hair. And I'd been growing my hair for about eight or nine months. And it was starting to finally grow to the length that I liked it. Well, I decided to go to college, and at that time, I decided to go to Biola College. Biola College in La Mirada had a dress code, which means that your hair has to be as short as when you're in the Army. And so I started thinking, do I want to go or do I not want to go? My hair is finally getting to the length that I want it to be and, and all, and finally I said, I'll go. Now, at that time, I had a motorcycle, I had a Harley, and so I drove my motorcycle to this place to get my hair cut. 
It was in Whittier. I grew up in Norwalk. So I drive to, to get my hair cut, and I went to this guy who had cut my hair before I had gone into the military, and I said, look, I need to get my hair cut. Could you give me a haircut? And, and I explained how I wanted it to be cut. And so he said, sure, no problem. And it was one of those, those moments that, you know, bad haircut is hard to deal with. And, and, and he's cutting it and talking to me and cutting my hair and talking to me. And then he turns me around to look at myself for the finished product. And what he had done is he had given me one of these looks like I had a, I had a pompadour. And I used to wear that in high school, but that was not the way I wore my hair. And it had this, like, a 53 Chevy kind of the hood look, you know. And I'm looking at myself. And all I need to do is roll my sleeves up and put a pack of Marlboro in there, and that's, you know, and I'm, I look like Fonzie. And as I'm looking, I'm, I, I get mad. I mean, I'm really mad. And I give him his money. I climb on my bike, and I drive home. Now, as I'm driving home, you can hear the wind over my helmet. Whew, and my hair was my helmet. It was all sprayed. You know, and I'm just getting angrier every minute. When I got home, I went into the house, and I stuck my head under the faucet, and I started washing my hair to try and comb it out, and it was like, there's no way it's going to happen. Now I'm mad. So I started to complain against the Lord. I climb on my motorcycle, and I just take off. As I'm riding down the street, I hit a turn. I'm going to take a right turn. And I downshift, and I power into second gear. And as I do so, I'm saying to God, I can't even get a lousy haircut. What is wrong? And bang, I hit the ground. The minute I, I, hit the, I hit the accelerator, I spun the bike around, I hit the ground. No, I was not hurt. The bike was not even damaged, but I could almost hear the Lord say, and you were saying to me, what? I mean, I could almost, I could almost hear that. I am serious. I picked the bike up and drank it off to the side. Not a scratch on me, not a scratch on the bike. There's some people driving by looking at me, shaking their head like, what a fool. And I'm standing there next to my bike, and I'm thinking, I am sorry. I am sorry. Because I had this habit of always blaming God. I was a new Christian. And now I'm starting to study the Scriptures, and the words start coming, there is no fear of God in them. There is no fear of God in them. I don't know about you, and I don't want to teach you superstition. But I suspect that the Lord knows how to spank His children in just the right way way. I suspect. Now, in my case, I did attribute that to me yelling at the Lord. I did not yell at him again while on my bike. <laughs> but you know what? We do have, we do have uh, ample scripture that points out that people have no fear of God. And the bottom line is, is that's the sign of an unbeliever. We of all people ought to be aware of the Lord that he truly is listening to us and so we should have reverence for him. And finally, Psalm 77. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. You hold my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. And I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. The waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters. Your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron." And so Psalm 77, another psalm of Asaph, it's called a song of sorrow or lament. 
And that's how he begins. Notice with me in verses 1 through 3 that he's complaining to the Lord. In verse 3, I remembered God was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. So he's in great sorrow and desperation. He's crying out to God while in distress. Now, I want you to notice this in verse 2, how he says, My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I'm stretching out my hands to God. And I'm asking God to, if you will, it's, 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 to me, it seems like a picture. And I understand this. I mean, I've done this. You have too. In the middle of the night when you're, in, when you're going through whatever it may be that you're going through. And some of us have gone through some things others have yet to do that. But some of us have no, know what it's like to, to have a night of sorrow, a night of anguish, a night of tears, where you're praying and you're saying, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Lord, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I need your help. And, and this is a picture that we have from the psalmist when he says, I stretched out, uh, my hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. It's, it's a picture of him just raising his hands to the Lord. And, and to me, it reminds me of something that I'm seeing and being refreshed of even right now as, a, as a, 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 a grandfather of a baby, uh, my Josiah, who does that kind of thing to grandpa. And I love it to pieces, I have to tell you. I love it. How that my, my grandson, um, yesterday Marie basically had our grandson, Josiah, and she took him home. And, and as, as he's home with Marie, you know, I know that the baby's there and, and I come home and as, as I come home, you can hear the garage door going up and, and Marie's cooking and she's got the baby in her arm. And, and when I come walking into the house, I just stand there very quietly in the hall and then Grandma, Marie, will say, Josiah, Josiah, who's here Who's here? He's 13 months old now. Who's here? And then he talks. He says, hi. That's his only word. <laughs> he actually says, bye, too. And mani. No. Um, <laughs> he says, hi. And so she says, who's here? And he just starts to jabber. And you can hear him yelling out, hi, hi. And man, you know, and I'm standing in the hall, and then I come walking in to where he's at, and I look around the corner, right? And he's looking around to see where Grandpa is, and so I start saying, Josiah, and he hears my voice. And then I'll come around the corner, and then he, Josiah, and he'll look at me, and the minute he looks at me, he gets this big old smile in his face, and he shoves Grandma. He starts to push her. He pushes her. And oh, I love it. And he pushes her. <laughs> and then he falls. He'll basically fall out of her arms towards me with his arms outstretched because he loves his grandfather. And you want to know something? God is doing such a wonderful thing in my life by remembering how my babies were. And it reminds me of how dependent they were on their papa the way that I, as a baby, was dependent on my father, but more so, spiritually, how I do the same thing to God. I do the same thing to God. Some people might be embarrassed to admit that, but I do. There have been many times in my life, and yours too, where you've said, Lord, pick me up. I need to be held by you. You may not be saying it that way, but that's what you're longing for. You want the Lord to put his arms around you and you stretch your hand out to him the way that the babies do to us. When I come walking in and, and my Josiah's in his little walker and I walk in and everything's fine until he sees Grandpa and then he stands on his tiptoes and he stretches his hands up and he's basically saying, I'm tired of being in this thing. Take me out and take me for a walk, Gramps. And I say, here I am. I'll carry you wherever you want to go. That's fine with me and I will hold him till my arms get numb. But the neat thing about it is God's arms never get numb, and we never get too heavy. And he's saying here, I was complaining, I was crying out, I stretched out my hand to you, I need you, Lord. How many of you understand what he's saying? I think most of us do. How many of us understand that? God, I need you. And that's what he's saying. I cried out to God with my voice. To God with my voice, he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God. I was troubled. I complained. My spirit was overwhelmed. 
In Psalm 142, verse 2, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. I'm crying out, God, help me. In verse 4, you hold my eyelids open. I can't sleep. I'm so troubled, I can't speak. I've considered the days of old, the years in, of ancient time. I call the remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart. My spirit makes diligent search. I'm so troubled, Lord, because I cannot sleep at night. There's so many concerns in me that I'm unable to do that, and I see that, Lord, you're working through this. And I begin to think, verse 5, I, can, I begin to think about the, the way things used to be, the years of ancient times. Now, you have moved in the past, and, and I'm asking you, Lord, I call the remembrance my song, and then I remember times when I could, I could sing myself to sleep, when I could put my head on the pillow, and I had a great time worshiping God when I first got saved. We would go to Bible studies the way I used to go to parties. I was 20 years old. And, and I was one of these kids that it didn't matter if it was Monday or, or Sunday or anything in between. If there's a party, you could say let's, and I'd say go. And let's do it, you know, and we'll party all night long. I didn't work. And when I did work, I'd only work long enough to save up a little money so I could use that money uh, very sparingly you only needed a couple of bucks for a half gallon of wine, only needed $10 for some pot, you know, and I would do that. That was my lifestyle. That's all. I did not work. I would climb into dumpsters behind, behind uh, service stations, gas stations, and I would find a tire that would fit on my car, and then I would take to a friend's uh, garage where he worked, and he would change my tires for me. I never had matching tires in my car. Didn't need them. I just would find some old tire. I didn't work. I was one of those guys that would, you know, just do that. That's what I did I, and, and all of that. And, and, and if there was a party, you know, I'd say, I got the car. You got the money. I got the car. You got the dope. I got the car. I'll drive you. You give me some money. We'll smoke some dope. I'll take you to the party. That's just the way it was. And so wherever there was a party, I would find it. I would go to it. Now I'm saved, and we're doing that with Bible studies. Hey, there's a Bible study in La Habra. Let's go. There's a Bible study in Long Beach. Let's go. There's a Bible study in Costa Mesa. Let's go. And we would stay up at night. We would stay up at night after going to Calvary Costa Mesa at the youth study. We'd come back, and we'd stay up until 1 o'clock in the morning worshiping the Lord and singing. We would hold hands, and we would pray. We'd read the Scriptures, and we'd worship God. That was my introduction to the Jesus movement. It was all about Jesus Christ. You know, it wasn't like, I'm going to church now. I already did my time in church. It wasn't that way at all. It was, all right, man, let's go back and have an afterglow. Let's go back to the house, and let's get into the Word some more and pray. And that's what I did. I, would, I was told, you need to read the Bible. So every night... I would read the Bible every night before I went to sleep, and I would sing the songs that I had heard at the church that day, and brand new songs to me. The Bible says that we have a new song in Jesus Christ, and they were new songs. And I would sing myself to sleep. I did it all the time. I would put my sisters in the car, and we'd be going someplace, and I would be teaching them the praise songs that I been, been, had been taught. And we would sing wherever we went. We sang all the time, all the time. I understand what he's talking about here. I consider the days of old, the years of ancient time. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart. My spirit makes diligent search. God, what's going on in my life? What happened? I'm complaining to you. I'm stretching out my arms to you. I know you're listening, but it feels like you're distant from me. And so in verse 7, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? This has caused him to wonder whether God loves him anymore. He wonders if perhaps he's done something that makes God mad at him. By the way, what he's writing down is something every mature believer understands. Every Christian who's been walking with the Lord for a while understands. Every one of us can look back and say, Lord, it seems that there have been times in my life that you and I have been tighter than we are right now. Are you mad at me? Have I done something that is keeping your hand off me? Let me give you one little bit of insight, and then I'll move on. This is not planned, but it's practical. When you're a brand-new Christian, it's like when you're a brand-new baby, we'll say, Mama takes an awful lot of care of you because you have to be watched 24-7. And so I find myself even now hovering around 
Josiah. I mean, my daughter Corinne cracks up. Dad, relax. No. I'm not going to relax. He might fall down. He fell down yesterday. Marie's, uh, Marie's um, got her um, little um, charger for her cell phone, and it's one of these chargers that has the prongs, you know, that you insert into the electrical outlet, and they can be pushed down so that it's just a smooth surface. But it was laying on the ground with the prongs up, and he fell face first on it yesterday. But you know what? And I couldn't move quick enough to get to him. I was across the room, and, and he was kind of crawling and sat up and fell forward. And all I could picture was those things going right into his eyes. That's all I could see. And my heart stopped in my chest. But he, he, he just landed short of it, you know, and it didn't hit him. And I thought, it, it only takes a second. It don't. See, so parents know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's, there's that sense of, and that's how you are. Now, when the baby begins to walk and starts to, well, you know that he's going to fall. There's going to be some things they go through. And sometimes you don't, remo you don't react as quickly. There are some things they have to learn, and they will learn. When I was first saved, it seemed that no matter how soon I'd pray, this is the truth, I would pray, God, it seemed like God answered that fast in some wonderful ways. And, I, and I'd blow my mind. I'd say, wow, God answers. Yesterday, I woke up yesterday morning, and a song, oh, this, none of you will relate to this. Maybe let's see if I can find an old person or two out there. You might. <laughs> There's an old song by the mamas and the papas. Why I woke up with this, I do not know, okay? But there's a phrase in it where it says, what does it say? I'm so old, I forgot the words. <laughs> I, I, it won't be proper. I know the words aren't what I'm going to say, but the thought is like, uh, uh, cloudy water casts no reflection, something like that. It was just a phrase. Now I'm going to think here for an hour, saying, oh, what was the line? But Anyway, it's like dirty water casts no reflection or something like that. And it's just a little phrase. And I talked to Marie about that. And I said, you know what? I said, do you know what that means? And we were talking about it for some reason. She goes, yeah. She's saying that, she says, when it's clear water, you can look at it. It's like a mirror. But when it's muddy and dirty, you look at it and you can't see yourself. I said, yeah, that's, that, that's right. I said, you know what the Lord was speaking to my heart through that this morning? And she says, what? And I said, I said, you know what? When the clear water of the Holy Spirit is working in my life, Jesus Christ can be seen in me. But when my life is, is dirty, is cloudy, is got flesh in it, the image of Christ is not going to be seen. And I, and I was telling her, I said, and I believe that God wants us to have the clearness of the Spirit so He can be seen through our lives. And, and sometimes I allow things to get into my life that will cloud Him so that when people look at me, they're seeing me in my flesh. And that's how I think. That's what I think about all the time. And, and when I was a young believer, there were times when, when I know that I could ask and God would answer even before I finished speaking. But let me say this. When you get older in the Lord, there are times that the Lord will allow you some time in between the request and the answer because he's stretching you to allow you to trust in him through hard times. And that's how it works. So some of you have been crying out, God, how long, how long? And it's not as if his ear is deaf. I want you to see this because the psalmist says, I cried out to the Lord with my voice, to, the God, to God with my voice. He gave ear to me. It's not that he isn't listening. He's giving you some time for your faith to be refined. That's a very practical lesson for all of us to learn before we blame God. But the question is, will God cast us off forever? Will he be favorable? No more. Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Well, of course, the answer would be no. Verse 10, I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Three things there. I will remember, I will meditate, and I will speak. That's how it works. I will remember what you have done. I will think about what you have done. That will give to me fuel and hope, and then I'll speak about the things that you want to do, and I will talk of your deeds. That's how it works in our life. 
That's how it should be, to remember, to meditate on, and talk of God's works. Because his answer comes through God's word, which reveals those things to him. That's what he's saying when he's saying, I'll remember. I'm going to remember. How do you know these things? I found these things in the word of God. Listen, when you're going through a tough time, do not forsake the reading of the word of God. Do not forsake God's word. That's the first thing a lot of people do. When you go through a hard time, you stop praying and you stop reading. And God is saying, you don't do that. You need to remember what I've said in the past so I can show you that I'm faithful now in your present. So it goes on, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have, with your arm, redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Your way is in the sanctuary. My life is made better when I'm in fellowship with believers who worship you. At the sanctuary, there are people who love the Lord. When I'm alone and I isolate myself, when I'm crying at night by myself, it's not healthy. If you've got a dog and the dog's outside and the dog gets injured and you go out to try and reach that dog and it's hurt, what's the dog do? Well, a lot of dogs will go into a corner and if they're very hurt and you try to reach to help it, it may bite you. Dogs bite you when they get hurt. Animals do that, but human beings do it too, and we're not supposed to. You can get so injured that before you know it, you isolate yourself from everybody. you got friends calling you up saying, are you all right? I've been praying for you. And what do you say? When you're really injured, you say, leave me alone. I don't need it. Just, you know, I used to go to church. Don't want to go anymore. Bunch of hypocrites. I got hurt, and look at how they treated me. I've been alone, and nobody calls me. I'm calling you. Yeah, you're the only one, and it's too late. We have a tendency of doing that. We isolate ourselves, don't we? He says, I was crying out to God, and he was by himself. But then I went to the sanctuary. And when I went into the sanctuary, I was with other people who loved the Lord. And my faith was encouraged. And I didn't feel alone anymore because I knew that there were people in here who gone through the same thing as I. And I remember. And it's at the sanctuary that your word is presented. And as I hear your word, once again, I'm encouraged. You are a God who does wonders, he says in verse 14. You have declared your strength among the people, and you have with your arm redeemed your people. So I have a God that I worship in concert with others. In Colossians 3.16, Paul said it this way. He said, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And finally, the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and were afraid. The depths also trembled. Clouds poured out water. Sky sent out a sound. Your arrows flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters. Your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So this is poetic language portraying God's creation, bowing before his mighty power. And he's remembering how God took the children of Israel. Notice verse 20, how they, he led your people, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. He's remembering how God took his people and delivered them from Egypt, how that they were standing there by the Red Sea, and how that the the Egyptian army was behind them, and the pillar of the Lord was separating the Jewish nation from the Egyptians, and how that God separated that Red Sea, and they were able to escape, walking on dry land. And he's saying, you are a God who takes us from the hardest place, the impossible situation, makes a way of escape for us, safely delivers us. And if you did that for the children of Israel, I know that you will do that for me. If you took them safely from bondage into freedom, I know that you will do that for me. That's where the Word of God comes into our lives, by the way. When you read it, those things were written for us so that we might see how God will work in our lives now. That's why we study the Word, because these aren't just stories. These are facts, things that God will do for us.